Lucas and his like back left me like whatever. Uh, uh, I will present you later. Actually, we'll go to he said he's gonna be here later, but not now. You're gonna pay me money. Are you gonna make a donation to JCM? We're in the wow. Everybody should start doing that. Like the AAJ, what's the AAJ? The AAJ is a scam. The AAJ is a scam. It's not a scam. It's a scam. No, the JCM is an updated organization. It's not the truth. I would, I support that. Yeah, yeah. 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 Ye
you think this is a performance. You see a man in the theater. There's an audience. His lines are memorized. His actions are rehearsed. It is difficult to see that. I do not expect you to believe anything you're seeing or hearing. But knowing that, that is the only reason I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> you do have a choice, though. You could see this for what it is. Or you can imagine what it could be. They ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? Later they ask, what do you do? Which is just another way of asking, what have you become? It's not enough to have a name. People need something to call you. So you search and you look at all the roles the world has to offer you in them. You find the one that best reflects who you are. Before you came in here, there was a wall, and on that wall, there was a bunch of cards. Each performance, we only get one. A very lucky few get to play the part that they want. And tonight, you have been selected. I thought I knew my role. We're all the unreliable narrators of each other's story. Derek Delgadio, care of the Daryl Roth Theater. That's you. That's this book. Identity is a performance, but when our performances and others' perceptions do not align, we may fail to truly understand each other. In their foundational 2005 work on the communication theory of identity, Hecht and colleagues explain that our identity is defined and then redefined in our social interactions. Essentially, how we perform identity directly impacts our sense of self. Derek Delgadio's part magic, part storytelling, one man show explores the nuances of what it means to enact, create, and perform identity, prompting audiences to consider not only who they are, but how they wish to be seen by others. In and of itself, by Derek Delgadio. I read that it would take me eight years to learn how to hold a deck of cards properly. Eight years. <laughs> and which grip are you going to learn to hold them in? There's mechanics grip, box grip, straddle grip, dealer grip. I couldn't decide. So I just learned them all. <laughs> Taught myself how to shuffle. I learned the variations on these things. And then, of course, you got to put it to good use. So you start finding cards. You start. Do you remember your card? I didn't give you a card. <laughs> That's fine. I can work with that. Uh, I wanted credit for this stuff, though. So you start throwing in flourishes. That way they know you're a professional. That way they know you've been working. I loved it so much. And I shared it with other people. But then it was like, the more I shared it, the more disillusioned I became. I can see now, but looking back, other people just didn't appreciate what I appreciated about it. Other people literally could not see what I saw. Every secret has a weight to it. I learned that at a very early age. My mother and my father, he skipped town when he found out that she was pregnant, but my mother, she managed to work I don't know how many jobs and still found time to read me that time story. I don't know how she did it for so long. But that all changed when I was six. I remember being thirsty, so I grabbed my little cup and I walked into the living room and there on the couch is my mother kissing another woman. And this for me is surprising. But my mother, she sits me down and explains the nuances of love between two human beings. I cried myself to sleep that night. Not because my mom is gay, because that's the night I knew I never had a father. But she was happy. My best friend, 
His name was Ryan. And playtime with Ryan consisted of riding bikes and pretending we were pirates in a sandbox. And then one day I told Ryan about my new mom. Ryan said he couldn't be my friend anymore. That evening, I came home and found a Bible on my doorstep. And then, sounds glass shattering. Like finding a brick. We moved after that. I learned how to keep a secret. I started to use language I could hide in. I developed these rituals. Anytime a new friend would come to the house for the very first time, I'd run around hiding all the rainbow flags and indigo girl CDs. Anything I thought might expose me for who I wasn't. I managed to hide all the evidence of my mother's pride, my mother's identity. And then it was this girl, Lindsay, from school. I summoned every ounce of courage to ask her whatever dance it was. And then she said she couldn't go with me because my mom is gay. After that, all my secrets were replaced with go fuck yourself. Because every secret has a weight to it. And you can only hold them for so long. This is just a break. But it's going to be very difficult for any of you to see it like that anymore. I stood right here when I told you the story about the brick. Now, now it's not just a brick. Sorry. I remember reading that identity, true identity, is that which exists in one's own heart and is seen by another. I have no idea if that's true. But in this room, I see an individual, an achiever, Truth telling. Life of the party. A visionary. Keep up the good work. A good Samaritan. An artist. A public servant. I advocate. And you, you are my storyteller. And I am I come here every day. And I stand in front of a room of strangers and let them decide the value of my life. And I can see that now this is going to remain a mystery a little bit longer because you're going to take it with you. And that means this could have been whatever you want. so much, Alex. Hey, come on in. We're going to be shifting gears now into public address with an informative speech. So please welcome Jaden Kennedy.
Every summer, scientist and professor Dr. Anders Mahler of Paris Clay University and his assistants go on a road trip, traveling to Denmark to drive battered budget vehicles back and forth hundreds of times along rural routes in Denmark's Jutland Peninsula. Though these biologists surely love a long summer drive and listening to hours of their favorite jams, Mahler and his cohort we're actually using these vehicles' windshields as bug measurement devices. The Washington Post on October 22nd, 2022 explains, Mahler counted windshield splatters to track the insect's population and in over 20 years saw an 80% decrease. This wasn't just because the bugs had learned to steer clear of the road, but because over three fourths of the insect's population no longer existed this wasn't just alarming for entomologists, whose primary focus is on insects, but this windshield phenomenon has become a global development. The Smithsonian's Department of Systematic Biology in 2024 explains, insects make up over 80% of all global life. But the journal on June 5th, 2022 elaborates, insects whose taxonomic diversity now appears to be threatened by human activity are disappearing at rates human history has never seen. Considering scientists at Oxford University predict we are now entering what is discussed as the sixth mass extinction. Let's explore these roots and understand where the bugs are going, what their disappearance means, and implications to answer the question we all should be asking. Where have all the bugs gone? <laughs> While I am well, abolish the mosquitoes and terminate the fleas. Not all insects are created equally, and the need for these little critters is profound. Let's examine their necessity and why they're disappearing. First, why do we need bugs? Insects are some of the most omnipresent and diverse animals on our planet. NPR 2022 explains, the role insects play affect us more than we can imagine. They pollinate our crops, keep soil healthy, control pests, and act as critical resources for new medicine for larger animals within the food chain, such as fish, birds, and frogs. The eradication of insects will not only destroy, but irreversibly change the idea of a food chain as we know it. The Royal Society on March 29th, 2023 elaborates, bugs aren't just integral to Earth's ecosystems. A study by entomologists Mace Vaughn and John Lozzi reveals, the pollination that insects contribute to agriculture is worth over $59 billion to the U.S. economy, making insects not only a concern among scientists, but among policymakers and stakeholders alike. Next, where are the bugs going? A 2020 meta-analysis in science unearthed that insect populations, on average, have been globally declining at an alarming rate of 0.9% per year. That number is only growing. Warner's on December 6, 2022, accredits deforestation, pesticide use, artificial light pollution, and climate change as key factors. Dr. Jansen, a University of Pennsylvania professor articulates, there are more species of insects within 100 kilometers of a Costa Rica national park than in all of Europe. Shedding light out, this decline isn't just one of nature, but an issue of human cause. The meta-analysis also introduces an intriguing counter-finding. Freshwater insects here on the incline. Further clarifying, insects are thriving more in environments, less polluted by human interaction. As insects become more scarce, our world will slowly grind to a halt where we can't function without them. Let's go scavenging for answers. What no bugs means and why we aren't doing more. First, a world void of bugs is a world void of us. The aforementioned NPR paints a picture of dead quiet nights, feces filled streets, and rampant unpollinated crops. Most alarmingly though, they paint a picture of an imagined world where the human race may not exist. There has been a 300% increase in the use of agricultural production, dependent on pollination in the last 50 years. 
meaning a majority of the crops now being planted are relying on pollinators who are ceasing to exist. The UN back in 2019 warned, this is growing to a global food insecurity as we lose vital pollinators like Lepidoptera and bees, food for livestock and humans never grows. Biologist Gabe Golston reveals within his own lifetime in research, the insect's population has declined by a staggering 75%. And he fears the consequences may soon be catastrophic. Next, why aren't we taking action? Author and environmental journalist Oliver Millman tells Vox in 2022, little's happening because no one's talking about it. When issues aren't treated as critical calls to action, we lose resources. He sheds light into his imbalance of science through a paradigm of thought. We have one researcher studying 50,000 insects at a time and 50,000 researchers studying a single monkey. We're more perceptible to studying and combating humanity's origin beliefs in our primal roots than looking into our own impending eradication. We can't expect audiences to take action when they don't even know a problem exists because the voices voicing them are being overshadowed to what The Guardian in 2020 calls the collapse of nature. All of the to this one, Jill, causes him very deep within his own research into this decline. Let's do the same by drawing two implications. We disassociate when things are gross, and we're slow to action. First, when I see a bug, I scream. <laughs> but I'm not alone in my discomfort. As entomologist Sarah Geyers in 2017 notes, our disgust and discomfort with insects leads to our desire to eradicate, often spraying pesticides to solve short-term infestation issues, but damaging the entire ecosystem and poisoning farmers long-term. When we see things as taboo, we turn a blind eye. Farm Public Health in 2022 offers the Simmelweis Reflex, named after Dr. Simmelweis, who was persecuted for telling doctors to wash their hands. It's used to describe how social norms halt scientific progress. We can't accept that issues exist <clears throat> if we don't even have the guts to talk about them. Mm -hmm. Finally, we're slow to action. Dr. Ed O'Brien's research published in Psychological Science in 2022 educates, as humans, we tend to under-reward and under-invest in ongoing incremental reform, which complicates progress and leads to our negligence of impending tragedy. As all the aforementioned scientists have collectively undertoned in their own words, this decline won't just stop at bugs. We choose to prioritize recycling and changing straws instead of forcing billion dollar corporations to stop dumping trash into our oceans and polluting our skies. As the sixth mass extinction draws near, we'll face the modern ideal of a doomsday. And scientists, who have spent years dedicated to this research, fear that our species may not come out living on the other side. While bugs may not be missed on Mahler's windshield, be certain their disappearance in the next century may just prove to be the deadliest. Bugs are some of the grossest, most complex creatures on our planet, but we'd be nothing without them. So after exploring their necessity, their impact and unearthing implications we understand. It won't just be the first extinction insects don't survive, but the last extinction our world may ever see. Thank you so much, Jaden. While we wait for Avellino to finish up his extemp, he's real close, we're going to go ahead and shift back to oral interpretation of literature. This time, it's going to be duo interpretation, which means you get two for the price of one. So what they will be doing is they will be holding their black books and they will not be allowed to touch or look at each other. It's going to be a little weird, but uh, you'll, you'll catch on here in a minute. Let's go ahead and uh, welcome Rebecca Langford and Casey Looper. <laughs> Hmm. 
Your dream partner has already been built for you! Their traits, views, and feelings are programmed for the best romantic encounter possible. <laughs> Even though you're testing him for just three weeks, the atmosphere of your first encounter is of utmost importance. <laughs> we highly recommend that when happiness knocks at your door, you should open it. Hi, Alma. I'm Tom. It's nice to meet you, Alma. Uh, hello. <laughs> Shall we dance? Oh, you're a very beautiful woman, Alma. Your eyes are too mountain lakes so I could sink into. But don't you like compliments? Do you have a favorite poem? I do. I particularly like Rye, for example. Autumn day. Six and seven lines. Press them to ripeness, then chase, then follows the sweetness of wine. Second to last letter. E. What's the meaning of love? To make the road a better place. And what's the saddest thing you can think of? Dying alone. Am I doing something wrong? I am. I am. I am. I am. I they am. They test me, scan my brain, give me nonstop surveys. They fill these things with so-called mind files from 17 million people. Traits, views, feelings. Hi, Alma. I am. It's super complex. And God only knows how much it costs. And what's the result? Your eyes are like two mountain lakes I could sink into. I am. I am. I am. I'm tall. And I love you. <laughs> artificial intelligence blurs the line between what communication is human generated and what is artificially constructed. But one thing is clear. We don't like it. <laughs> Forbes on May 4th, 2023 explains, our distrust of artificial intelligence fosters an anthropocentric bias, meaning our mere awareness of communication with AI causes us to distrust the authenticity of the interaction. AI integration has become inevitable in our communication practices. However, our bias leads us to question not only if, but to what extent we're being manipulated. Screenwriters Hans Skomberg and Maria Blumenberg navigate our suspicions of artificial intelligence, suggesting perhaps when protecting our hearts through skepticism, it also leaves us artificially analyzing the reality of any interaction. I'm Your Man by Hans Skomberg and Maria Blumenberg. Good morning, Alma. Did you sleep well? I tied up your things so you could find them easier. They're all according to a system. 93% of women dream of this. And guess which group I belong to? The 7%. How'd you figure that out so quickly? Well, I'll need exactly 11 minutes to return everything to where it was. I'll even dirty up the windows. But you can leave the windows. I don't have time for this. I have to go to work. But I was so looking forward to our romantic little chit chat. I never chat. And that's why I love you. <laughs> Listen, Tom, I know you're programmed to be the perfect partner, but I can't stand three weeks of this. I can't stand one morning of this. I'll go nuts. I'm just here to test you for three weeks and write an evaluation. And love doesn't interest you at all? Zero interest. Tenderness? Closeness? Intense eye contact? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> I suggest you leave me alone and I leave you alone and we get through these three weeks with more or less dignity. Okay. My algorithm is designed to make you happy. Then leaving me alone should be no problem at all. Now I really have to go to work. Wait! Too much work is bad for you. You need to relax a little. <laughs> Do you want to get a drink? Peachy. Uh, wait here. Buy yourself something? I'll act like a person who wants things. Nobody would know the difference. Hello? What do I want today? Are you fucking kidding me? I can't believe we didn't know about this. Yeah, I'm sorry too. Alma. <gasps> What's wrong? What's wrong? I've been researching for three years. Three years! And right before we publish comes some chick and she's publishing three weeks earlier. This was all for fucking nothing. So, the tears in your eyes are only for yourself and your career. They're egotistical tears. <laughs> Please leave. Oma.
I can walk by myself. You're drunk. Can't you stop doing everything right? Can't you do something weird? Something? Can't you stop being perfect? You don't know what you want. No, I don't know what I want. That's how it is sometimes when you're human. <laughs> do you ever get angry? Is that like part of your algorithm? I believe it's appropriate. I can display anger or, <laughs> or even sound angry. <laughs> hey, but I don't know the difference. He doesn't know the difference yet he knows everything. Come on, there has to be a little anger in that tiny automated heart of yours. Don't talk to me that way. Why, will you short circuit? I said stop it! There you go. I'm sorry. Don't feel bad if it's beyond your algorithm's capabilities. Human. There's a gulf between us. We can pretend it doesn't exist, but certain things highlight how deep and insurmountable that gulf is. What things? Things that make you sad the second you think of them, even if you don't want to. Can things you long for that will never return. Can you show me these things? Show you? Yeah, um, over there. Cold. Warm, very warm. Can I open it? It's an ultrasound image of an embryo. Alma Fester, 11 weeks. Why wouldn't I understand? You've lost a child and would like to experience that. Alma. I can understand that it's not hard to understand. It sounds pathetic when you say it. It is pathetic. It's pathetic because it's relative. But it's also not pathetic because it's part of you. And that's why I love it. Oh, does the coffee smell good? Alma, uh, was I snoring? I think I was snoring. Isn't that strange? This isn't working. It's all wrong. I can't do this. Do what? I pull the covers up for you, even though you don't get cold. <laughs> I try to make you the perfect boiled egg, and you don't even have to eat. I'm acting in a play, except there's no audience. Even right now, I'm only talking to myself. Oh my I'm all alone. I'm turning into a lunatic, a nut job, a grinning oh idiot. And... Why are you crying? I'm ending the experiment early. Oh. But where am I to go? The factory, maybe? Alma. I'll be erased. I won't exist anymore. Oh, God. It's the part of not being alive. You don't have to die either. so very much and Jake if you wouldn't mind welcoming Avelino back in
So Avelino has had 30 minutes to prepare. Let's see how he does. Let's welcome our next speaker, Avelino Hammer. In 2023, France and Argentina faced off in the World Cup Finals, a competition where nations around the world compete at a title and a place in history. However, one nation did not compete in the World Cup, Sudan. No, not because their soccer team is terrible, which it is, but because of internal political stability. For the last four years, the Sudanese government has been partaking in an on and off civil war with multiple militias, looking to destabilize the Sudanese government. However, just recently, this war has taken a toll on Sudan in the form of oil production. Recently, in a skirmish between the Sudanese government and Molsha, multi anti-Sudanese related militias, a major oil pipeline was damaged in Sudan. As Reuters explains on March 17th of this year, this pipeline accounts for nearly two thirds of Sudan's oil production meaning that this is extremely detrimental to the amount of oil that Sudan is able to produce and then export to other countries. This is extremely detrimental and cannot be overstated, specifically because oil is the main way that Sudan, well, remains a nation. The World Bank explains on March 18th of this year that nearly 90% of Sudan revenue comes from oil, meaning that this blow from militias to Sudan cannot be overstated as it will is that will manifest in a lack of oil that Sudan can export. Considering that nearly 7.7 .7 million people live in poverty in Sudan, nearly two thirds of the country, that this detrimental effect could greatly exasperate the situation. It is important that we ask today's question. How will a halt in oil production impact stability in Sudan? The answer is that this temporary halt in oil production will lead to greater instability, both politically and socially for Sudan, which we can see in three ways. First, how it will lead to a devaluation of Sudanese currency. Second, how it will accelerate Sudanese state's dissipation. And finally, how it will lead to increased poverty in Sudan. Sudan used to have a good soccer team in the 1970s. However, the value of their soccer team has greatly been decreased over the years due to this political instability. Likewise, this disastrous oil event could lead to a devaluing of Sudan's currency. Third world countries like Sudan rely on foreign currency in order to keep their country running. Foreign currency means that investors are putting the U.S. dollar into your country. The Sudanese currency is weak compared to the U.S. dollar, so it relies on foreign investment to put the U.S. dollar a very strong global economy into Sudan to essentially increase productivity. And this is something that Sudan relies on. As Forbes explains on February 17th of 2024, the Sudanese government does not do a lot of subsidies for companies, meaning that the Sudanese state mainly runs on foreign investment to keep its workers paid and keep its economy productive. Unfortunately for Sudan, the, the multitude of this foreign investment comes in the form of oil investment. As the World Bank explains on January 17th of 2024, nearly 85%, 85% of Sudanese foreign investment comes from foreign investors into oil. Meaning that since this oil production is essentially stopped in Sudan, foreign investors not only won't invest, but they can't invest because there's no way that they will get a positive reinforcement from this investment. This lack of investment will manifest in decreased economic product productivity leading to instability in Sudan. In addition to economic woes, the Sudanese government also faces internal woes, mostly due to political instability, which brings us to the second way how this oil production halt will lead to increased political and economic instability, and that's because it will accelerate the deprecation of the Sudanese state. Since 2017, Sudan has been fighting a very expensive war against militias on multiple fronts. This war not only costs human lives, but also dollars. As Forbes explains on February 18th of 2024, over the last three years, 
The Sudanese government has invested nearly $88 billion into this war, which is nearly $15 billion a year, making it the single most valued asset that the Sudanese government has spent money on. If this war turns out bad, they have lost all this money and they'll have to keep putting more in in order to make sure that militias don't take over the government. However, the loss of this oil pipeline will mean that Sudan's government is taking in much, much less revenue in order to fund this war against militias. As the World Bank furthers on March 18th of this year, nearly 60% of revenue that the government takes, or taxes that it collects, comes from imports and exports of oil, meaning that when Sudan exports oil, they take a chunk off of that in order to fund this war against other militias. However, since nearly two-thirds of this oil will no longer be produced, that means that the Sudanese government will lose a significant amount of revenue that they fund this war. Essentially, this loss of oil revenue means that the militias against the Sudanese government has the upper hand. And this will only lead to increased social instability as the Sudanese government sees a deprecation of its state due to a lack of military funding. But the Sudanese government is not the only thing we need to worry about when talking about this issue. We also need to worry about the Sudanese people, bringing us to the third and final reason why this halt of oil production will ultimately lead to social instability. And that's because it will increase citizen poverty. For some background, Sudan is already really, really poor, and its citizens handle the brunt of this effect. As the World Bank explains on March 18th of this year, nearly 7.7 .7 million people live in poverty. And this will only increase, as the World Bank estimates, by nearly 1.8 million people in 2024, making it one of the poorest countries in the entire world. Unfortunately for both Sudan and its citizens currently living in poverty, this halt in oil production will ultimate, ex ultimately exacerbate the level of poverty that these citizens feel. This is mostly because many Sudanese citizens are very poor, so they have to take jobs that are low income, the most profitable being these jobs in oil. As Reuters explains on March 17th, nearly two thirds of Sudanese citizens partake in some job connected to oil, meaning that this loss of oil production will also manifest in the loss of real world jobs, creating instability in Sudan's economic and social caste. Returning to today's question, how will a halt in oil production impact stability in Sudan we saw that it will lead to increased economic instability, first, because it will devalue the currency. Second, how it will accelerate Sudan's deprecation of state. And finally, it will lead to increased citizen poverty. Thank you so much, Avelino. We're going to be shifting back to public address with after dinner speaking. If you're like me, you probably haven't eaten just yet, except for my GAs who had Taco Bell Baja Blast, I believe, earlier. Um, but uh, the idea of it is that it is supposed to be a comedic speech. Fingers crossed, here's hoping. We'll welcome up Brayden Hopkins. <laughs> Reality winner is your average American girl. She loves cats. She's fluent in Arabic, Farsi, and Dari. She also keeps a diary, complete with entries about burning down the White House. <laughs> Obviously, she sports dreadlocks, even though she's white. And in 2017, she was given the longest prison sentence in US history under the Espionage Act, Politico on June 30th, 2022, found, winner, a National Security Agency contractor leaked documents on Russian interference during the 2016 election to The Intercept and was quickly intercepted by the FBI. <laughs> Brookings, on July 30th, 2022, reveals, winner's employer, the National Security Agency, has legitimately no written rules defining its permission, scope, or responsibility. There's one rule in the NSA. Don't talk about the NSA. <laughs> Yet, NPR, on January 15th, 2023, explains, over 1.2 million people in the U.S. hold top security clearance, with an estimated 183,000 employed by the National Security Agency. But we'll never know for sure 
because it's classified. <laughs> Unlike my high school Twitter account. I tried to delete it, but I still can't pass a background check. <laughs> we must investigate the inner workings of the National Security Agency. Let's understand the background of the organization, how it currently operates, and the implications for our country. Reality winner lost big time, but her efforts to do her part leave us all wondering, is that really her name? <laughs> <laughs> Reality left the damning paper trail. She texted her sister about taking a polygraph for her NSA job, where they would ask if she plotted against the government. Her reply, hashtag gonna fail. <laughs> Meet you, girl. Let's get the history of the NSA through its creation and downfall. First, how was the NSA created? In 1938, Franklin D. Roosevelt announced Executive Order 8381, establishing three levels for American secrets. Confidential, secret, and top secret. Like tall, grande, and venti. Hold the milk, please. It makes my tongue hurt. In 1952, the NSA was born and would become the main organization responsible for collecting and protecting secret information. The agency adopted the Central Security Services in 1996 to prevent and eradicate threats manifesting on the internet. Well, NSA slash CSS, explain how I bought crystal meth on Twitter. <laughs> Second, how has the NSA failed? So many employees have access to secrets that they aren't really secrets anymore. Like the NSA, I also lie to myself and believe that my smoking habits are hidden from my mother. <laughs> the New York Times, on January 24, 2023, explains, the biggest document leaks have been done by 20-something NSA contractors, like Edward Snowden and Reality Leonard. Additionally, documents leaked by Snowden revealed the NSA opened over 4,000 internal investigations over internal sources threatening to harm the U.S. in 2012 alone. And in 2024, these trust issues need major psychological evaluation. <laughs> On February 26, 2024, pre-retirement NSA Director Paul Nicosum said the agency is still struggling to win back the trust of Americans. Look, people are terrified of the government knowing their search history. Not me, though. I'm an open book. I actually deleted the private browser. <laughs> <laughs> the FBI agents prosecuting reality winner aired out all of her grievances, including Facebook messages. Look, I only say I hate America like three times a day, winner wrote. I'm no radical. It's mostly just Americans' obsession with air conditioning. <laughs> reality. The global is warming. <laughs> Let's understand how the NSA operates in 2024. First, the NSA really loves contractors. In her 2023 book, Bottoms Up and the Devil Laughs, Carrie Halley reveals contractors are often called body shops, selling access to the 1.2 million Americans with top security clearances on websites like clearedconnections.com. It's the farmers only of top secret documents. <laughs> Additionally, Edward Snowden's classified and books boast, private contractors receive 70% of US intelligence funding and the other 30% goes to call of duty. <laughs> Pre-retirement, NSA director Paul Nicasson told CNBC on January 9th, 2024, the agency has 850 partners that share cybersecurity info with. Woof! I hope they get STD tested regularly. <laughs> Next, the NSA keeps getting caught in its lies. Like when my mom starts sniffing me like a bloodhound when I get home from the library. <laughs> in December 2023, Oregon State Senator Ron Weider wrote to the NSA, they needed to stop using Americans' personal data without their consent. Reuters, on January 24th, 2024, explains Instead of their typical strategy of deflection, the agency actually admitted to purchasing citizens' domestic browser data from commercial data brokers. But Nakasone promises there are no NSA programs focusing on monitoring Americans' use of the internet. Look, dude, I know you showed my mom my search history, and it's not cool. I did not buy meth 
on Twitter. <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, the whole reason I'm giving this speech is because I saw an ad for the HBO feature Reality, starring my celebrity crush, Sydney Sweeney. <laughs> Thankfully, they didn't give her good luck. <laughs> Two implications, the military industrial complex and dangerous leaks. First, NSA activities fund the military industrial complex. The Center for Policy Studies on April 13, 2023 found. Last year, the average American taxpayer gave $298 to the top five military contractors and a whopping $1,087 to Pentagon contractors alone. The U.S. uses shady avenues to move money, similar to when I use my book scholarship to buy a base. Except my mom got mad at me. In 2021, Newsweek reporter William Arkin discovered over 130 private companies handing out security clearances to 60,000 people under fake identities, receiving $900 million in federal salaries. If a Newsweek reporter can figure this out, how safe are our secrets? <laughs> Americans deserve to know what their tax dollars are being spent on. And using national security as a way to cover up millions is eerily similar to Mattress Fund's business strategy. <laughs> <laughs> Second, leaks have dangerous consequences. And NSA contractors are not the only people with the power to reveal information. The Verge, on April 13, 2023, explains. Jack Texara, a 21-year-old National Guard member, was known as OG on the Thug Shaker Central Discord. <laughs> OG leaked, mode, leaked, leaked documents on the Russia-Ukraine war and U.S. spying against their effort, uh, spying allies against their effort, spying efforts against their allies. Which they, which thugs are they shaking down? Babies. <laughs> the leak triggered international conflict, but The Atlantic, on April 13, 2023, confirms OG's only motive was to impress his friend group of online gamers. Jack, all you need to do to impress your friends is take a shower. <laughs> U.S. allies count on us to keep their data safe, but when classified information is leaked, people's lives are at risk. Even though NSA leaks might not be the worst thing on Discord, they represent dangers domestically and abroad. Reality winner was a horrible leaker. She looked up. Do top security computers detect when a flash drive is inserted? On her work computer. <laughs> After understanding the background, operation, and implications of the National Security Agency, we see it's not much slicker than winner. So the next time you buy drugs on the internet, just know, the NSA is always watching. <laughs> Thank you so much, Braden. And so I'll let Sophie get settled for a second, just in time for us to also then kick her back out. So uh, Sophie Akhtar is going to be performing a limited preparation event called Impromptu Speaking, meaning Sophie has no idea what she's going to be talking about right now. And so she's going to get settled, we're going to kick her out, and you all are going to help us decide what she's going to talk about. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, you guys can take me out. All right, I see you in a little bit. This is going to take just a few minutes anyway. All righty, so Sophie is leaving the room. That was close too. Okay, great. So we're going to be farming out some options for Sophie to discuss this evening. So if you have a quotation that you would like Sophie to speak on this evening, Feel free to raise your hand and we'll, we'll start getting those. So we can go, I mean, if it's a quotation from Shakespeare, great. The past couple of nights we've had Lil Uzi Vert and Drake. So uh, whatever you all would like to hear this evening. Yes. Oh, yeah, there we go. Every day is payday. 
Swipe my card and I hit the name. <laughs> Every day is payday. Swipe my card, then I hit the name. Okay. I'm not going to fully commit to that. <laughs> um, by who? Fifth Harmony. Fifth Harmony. <laughs> All right. So we've got we've got one option here. Yes. It's important for me to let my fans know I really don't care. I'm confident. He's great. We got Drake coming back again. It's important for my fans to know I really don't care. I'm confident. All right. We got two. Third one. Yes. Okay, cool. So if you don't aim too high, you aim too low. J. Cole. Awesome. All right. We got three. Any others? Last night we had like eight options. Okay, it sounds like we've got three solid options here. Let's remind us one more time. Where'd we start? Maggie? Every day is payday. Swipe my card, then I hit the nay. Every day is payday. Swipe my card, then I hit the nay nay. We've got that as one option. What's our second one? It's important for me to let my fans know I really don't care. Okay, we got Drake, and then we have, where's our third one? Fantastic. If you don't aim too high, or if you aim too high, say it one more time. <laughs> if you don't aim too high, you aim too low. Perfect. All right, so everyone gets one vote. So who wants to hear about swiping the card? Oh, my goodness. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I'm not even going to count. Um, let, let's go with uh, number two, Drake. Who wants to hear about that? Hey. Yeah, that's right. Fantastic. And then for option three, J. Cole. I'm sorry. It seems like we do have a winner, so I am going to write this down. Uh, actually, I want to have Maggie write it down. <laughs> All right, so you think we would mind going and getting our speaker? Yeah, <laughs> so for this event, impromptu speaking, Sophie will have seven minutes in total to both construct and deliver her speech. So please welcome Sophie Octor. Quotations on the other side of the paper. I'll be sitting here in the center. I will give you your time signals. I'll give you your 15 seconds grace to read it. I'll let you know when that's elapsed and your prep begins. And I'll count it down from five minutes left, four, three, two, one minute left. It's one thirty seconds. At Fifteen. I give you the last time. Okay, flipping over the quotation. Are you ready? Are you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's 15, prep begins.
30 seconds. One minute. Chaperone is one of my favorite musicians. For those of you who don't know, she's a queer singer-songwriter pop star from the Midwest, and she makes music by a queer person for other queer people. Her music was not initially super popular, and she was dropped by her label after only three years. But after releasing her music online, she was able to find lots of success in doing what she loves every single day. It's just this idea of taking what we do and what we love and doing it every single day that brings us to today's quotation. Every day is payday. Swipe my card, then I hit the nay nay by Fifth Harmony. <laughs> we can interpret this to mean that joy is found in everyday actions or nay nays. <laughs> <laughs> and we can agree by looking towards the days, the average days for happiness. We can see how we can do this in two ways by doing what we love and surrounding ourselves with people we love. Mm -hmm. First, we can see this, how we can look towards the average days for happiness by doing what we love through two examples. Rossini Furniture, Sandy Lang. John Rossini has been selling furniture for years and restoring it, but it wasn't always what brought him lots of joy. This started only a couple of years ago when he started collecting tennis memorabilia. Now he has a massive collection of tennis memorabilia, with rackets dating back to the 1800s and tennis balls and autographs in the hundreds and thousands. His collection has even been admired by the tennis collectors of America. He's been able to do what he loves every day, not only through furniture restoration, but also in collecting just tennis memorabilia. Second, we can see this through Sandy Lang. Sandy Lang is a fashion designer who's become very popular in the last couple of years. If you're a fashion girly, you'll know who she is. <laughs> she takes inspiration from her past and her childhood and infuse it into her fashion. She grew up in Chinatown in her father's restaurant. And she's taken this in, she's taken this as lots of inspiration for her fashion. She's been able to turn her father's menu into a print for a dress. And she even takes inspiration from just girlhood things like bows, putting them on all kinds of clothing. It's these ideas of doing what we love that brings us happiness in the everyday that we saw through Rossini Furniture and Sandy Lang. Second, we can see how we can find joy and look towards our happiness in the everyday through, by surrounding ourselves with people we love through All Fired Up and David Shenton. All Fired Up is a ceramic studio located in Las Vegas, Nevada, founded by Gail Skomish. Skomish has been creating ceramics for years. But following the 2017 Las Vegas shooting, she wanted to do something for her community rather than just herself. So she decided to take ceramic tiles, paints, tables, and volunteers to a local memorial service. She was able to provide people with a way to process their grief all together as a community. While she may not have known all of these people on an individual level, she felt the love for the people of Las Vegas and was able to communicate that through her pottery and her ceramics. While she may not have intended to create a memorial that would outlive her likely, she did so through her ceramics and by leaning into her community to find joy in the everyday. Finally, we can see this through David Shenton. David Shenton has been knitting his entire life, or at least he's wanted to. He started knitting at age five, but his father didn't exactly approve of his knitting and he burned all of his creations when Shenton was five, right in front of him. This was devastating, 
and deterred Shen from knitting for decades. Now, he's 74, and he's picked up the craft again. And he's even created the UK um, Norwich Men's Knitting Club, which is open to all people who identify as male. He's created a safe space for people who don't usually go towards knitting because he wanted to create that safe space that he didn't have growing up. Now, the United Kingdom Hand Knitters Association has even complimented his work, saying that he's changing the demographics of knitting. And the number of men in the knitting community has doubled in the UK since 2020. Now, this can't all be accredited to Shenton, but it's not saying that he didn't do something good for the community. We understand that surrounding ourselves with those we love, whether we know them directly or not, does a lot for our everyday joy and happiness. And we saw this through All Fired Up and David Shenton. Returning to today's quotation, every day is payday. Swipe my card, then I hit the nay-nay by Fifth Harmony. We interpreted this to mean that joy is found in everyday actions and we can look towards average days for happiness. So while I may not be as good of a performer as Chapel Rowan sometimes, we understand that this is a great opportunity for us to find joy in the everyday. And Chapel Rowan helps me do that whenever I listen to her music on the daily. Thank you so much, Sophie. And our final speaker this evening will be performing an oral interpretation of literature of prose. So prose interpretation takes material that was meant to be read, not said. I think Casey's going to do a good job anyway. So our next speaker and final speaker for the evening, Casey Busson. Before I begin, I would like to offer a brief content warning. This piece does contain homophobic slurs. So if at any point, either now or during the piece, you need to do anything to protect yourself, please do so. It's Christmas Eve, and I'm still trying to find a stupid Christmas present for my stupid brother-in-law, Jared. Oh, it's cold as balls, but I didn't bring a hat because I don't like my hair to get messed up. Well, if it stays like this, maybe we'll get snow on Christmas. There's even a patch of it on the ground. I can't remember it snowing. It's a perfect white mound, smooth and untouched, except for a half-buried pine cone. Ow! Not a pine cone, a sphere with brown spikes. Probably shouldn't touch it. Should just leave it where I found it. Instead, I dump it in my pocket and walk home. The sphere feels heavier than when I picked it up, and the spikes have curled a bit. Maybe I killed it. It's pulsing, and it cracks. The shell of the thing splits open. From inside spills the huddled form of an animal covered in thick white liquid. It, it's human? It's me. In his 1984 journal article, Why Homosexuality is Abnormal, philosopher Michael Levin argued how and why queerness is unnatural. Since then, homophobes from Piers Morgan to the Indian Psychiatric Society's president to Speaker of the House Mike Johnson have regurgitated this claim to defend their homophobia. And yet, queerness can be found in any civilization, time period, and species. It's homophobia and transphobia that can only be found in humans. Author R.J. Edwards proposes an alien coming to Earth would have no knowledge of homophobia, but would recognize the beauty of queerness, proving hate alienates, but love is universal. Mm. What Cheer by R.J. Edwards. There's a pod person in my bedroom where my skin and my hair and, and my junk and my face. <laughs> They squint their eyes, my eyes, 
and they say in my voice, hi. <laughs> New option, run into the bathroom and lock the door. In my hurry, I neglected to grab my phone so I can escape through the window, stay here until I die, or go face them. I could take me in a fight. <laughs> Hello? Oh, I can hear them hovering outside the door. I did not mean to scare you. I will not harm you. It was so loud. Is that what I sound like? <laughs> Listen, I, um, I have a lot of questions, obviously, but before I come out, can you be someone else, but I connected with you. The walk has begun. My kind connect with the host and replicate their shape so that we may walk with them. We arrive, we walk, we know, we leave. We do not come back. Wow, okay, Jesus. Mm. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna open the door now. <laughs> They're real. My face, oh, all of it. Um, <laughs> could you put some clothes on? They're mortified. I taught shame to an alien species. <laughs> <laughs> Their posture becomes shrinking. More like mine. Listen, it's whatever. I find them a t-shirt, jeans, and a puffy coat. I think I'm hungry. Okay, let, let's get you some food. Before we leave, I apply terrible thick black liner around their eyes and give them a hat with ear flaps. The whole disguise reminds me of myself around 20, closeted and transparently false. But Addie Jr., AJ, has none of the anxious mannerisms I did. The ear flap hat is cute on me. <laughs> Leaving the ball food court, we head down the escalator. I can see AJ's breath catch as they take in the elaborate Christmas decorations. After they touch and smell every single fucking thing in Lush, <laughs> I buy a bath bomb and a gift card for mom and Sook Jan Stevens' stupid Christmas box up for stupid Jared. <laughs> AJ holds up a Thor God of Thunder comic book. As I pay for it, I'm already thinking about how long after they leave I should wait to throw it away. My phone goes off while we're waiting for the bus. Hello? Hey! My sister says. Oh, hey, AJ, hey! Sorry, I'm outside, it's a little loud right now. Everything okay? My sister starts talking at me about the logistics of dinner prep, not saying what she called to say, which is, don't ruin Christmas. Mm -hmm. But I don't hear her. Someone's with AJ. He's tall and he's leaning in and AJ is just smiling the same way they smile at me as this guy puts his arm up on the bus stop plexiglass. Uh-huh, sorry, bus is here, see you tomorrow. We gotta go, sis. Bus isn't here yet, the dude says. I grab their arm and pull them away from him. He follows. Fucking bitch! Fucking faggot! I let go of their arm and we get across Memorial Boulevard. Did that person mean to harm us? Are they an enemy? No, it's not. I'm so shaking, panicked and mad, mad at them for not understanding. Fuck, how do you have my brain and not get this stuff? How do you just stand there? They're looking at me. Waiting. Scared. And my oversized coat, they look like a teenager. Hmm. I remember they're younger than that. It's complicated, but, but we're okay now. Let's just go home. 
their face, which is my face. They're so close to mine, and, and they're smiling at me. They smile so much more than I do. They don't get it. I think I'm going to miss you <laughs> in a few hours. I realize I'll have to go to my sister's place and pretend everything's normal. I think I am going to miss you too. It's time. The clothes I let them start to drop away. Their skin and hair turn white and then something too bright to look at directly. Hey, 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 wait! But they have no ears to hear me. And no mouth to reply. They're gone. I consider staying home, but my family would use it against me just as much as showing up. I decide I'm going to keep their stupid comic book. Thank you so much, Casey, and thank you all once again for coming out this evening and for staying. We really appreciate you all. I hope you have a wonderful night, and roll tide. Roll tide. Have a good night. Thank you.